Let us prepare our hearts for worship. <laughs>
the days of Ezekiel, the clouds be coming as much. These are the days of your servant David, building the temple of praise. And these are the days of your harvest, the fields are as wide as the world. And we are the laborers in your bid, declaring the word of the Lord.
Lord God helps us, we will not be disgraced. The Lord God helps us, who can declare us guilty. Sister and brothers, beyond the shadow of a doubt, your sins are forgiven. By the mercy of Christ, let us stand together, forgiven and free.
living word of God, we praise you that you continue to speak, you continue to call, you continue to invite us to follow and sing our own hosanna. Grant that as your word is read this day, we may hear and we may follow. Through Christ, amen. Our first reading today is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, which can be found in the Pew Bible on page 197. But the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as, some, with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 31, it's verses 9 through 16, which can be found in your pew Bible on page 5 and 5. <coughs> and let's read this one together. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye wakes away from grief, my soul and body also. For my life was spent with sorrow, and my years with sight. My strength fails because of my misery, and my bones waste away. I am the sport of all my adversaries, a horror to my neighbors, an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I have passed out of mind like one who is dead. I have become like a broken vessel. For I may hear the whispering of many, terror all around, as they seem together against me, and they plot to take my life. But I trust in you, O Lord, I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Let us shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. Then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. 
So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. It was also because they, they heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. The Pharisees then said to one another, You see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. The grass withers, the flower falls. The word of our Lord endures forever. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, for the gift of your word, grant we give you thanks. And now, as your word is proclaimed, we pray that insofar as what is said is true, you would write it in our hearts, give us the grace to obey. And so far as it is false, may it fall to the ground, soon be forgotten, and do no harm. Amen. Palm Sunday is in profile and courage. Jesus knows what he's doing. He knows what he is provoking. He knows that he is poking the proverbial bear. He reenacts the prophecy of Zechariah. Lo, your king comes to you, humble, riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Humble and victorious is he. And understand the topography. The Mount of Olives is similar to Mount Penn in terms of elevation. And so imagine coming down Duryea Drive, only instead of Duryea Drive having those nice curves to make it safe, this one's straight. And so you're coming down the slope over here. You're riding on that donkey, and you've got your disciples and this crowd around you waving palms and throwing their coats down, and just in general, making a grand noise. And over on this side of the valley, over on this side of the valley, you have the temple. And there in the temple are the priests and the Pharisees looking out and seeing and hearing. The whole world's gone after them. And right next to the, to the temple is the Antonia, which is the Roman fortress that was built to watch the temple. But they can also look across the valley and they can see this procession making its way down the Mount of Olives. And while the Romans may not have known about Zechariah, and they may not have known the intricacies of Jewish law and all of that, they knew trouble when they saw it. And make no mistake, Jesus is coming to Jerusalem to make trouble. He is coming so that all will bend to the knee. So point one, Jesus comes. The coming of Christ to the temple, the coming of Christ to Jerusalem, coming in such a humble fashion, tends to throw us. We look to Jesus and we tend to project on him our desires, our wishes, our hopes, our dreams. And that's one of the risks Jesus takes in doing such a symbolic act is that all, all of us are going to read into his actions what we want to read in. The crowd was doing that right there with Jesus. They're saying, Hosanna to the king, and by king we mean the one who throws the Romans out. They're saying, Hosanna to the Savior. Hosanna literally means to save us. And they're saying that because they want him to deliver them from all the things that they are dealing with that are wrong. And how often are we in the same place when we look to Jesus? We want Jesus to be the fulfiller of our hopes, the giver of our dreams. We want Jesus to be the one who does things for us. but not one who asks things of us. We want to be able to stand on our own two feet. But Jesus isn't coming for that. Jesus is coming so that we will all bend the knee. You see, part of what 
we all too often miss is we simply look at the surface of things. We simply look at the political powers and the religious powers, these institutions, and we think that's what Jesus is coming to deal with. Or maybe he's coming to deal with, with me and with my sins, and that's what he's coming to do. But Paul's letter to the Philippians points us to the fact that there is something much greater going on. That Jesus isn't simply coming to deal with the temple. He isn't simply coming to deal with Rome. And he isn't simply coming to deal with me and my sins or, or my hopes and my dreams. Jesus is coming to change the world. Jesus is coming to fulfill the vision of God begun back in Genesis. To make all things new. <coughs> Including us. We filled our lives, we filled ourselves, we filled our world with so many things. So many things that stand between us and God. So many things that keep us from God's way. And so Jesus comes in the exact opposite way. We want to fill. We want to get more. Jesus empties. We want to receive. Jesus gives. We want to know what's in it for us. And Jesus offers himself. It's a totally different way. And yet, when we follow in that way, we discover that there's no better way in the world. And so the first question I submit that Palm Sunday poses to us this morning is where do we need to let go of things? What are we holding on to? What stands between us and Jesus, us in the way of God, what keeps us from taking that next step? And what would we be like? What would the world be like? What would our church be like? What would our lives be like? What would our families be like? What would we be like if we bent the knee and let that go? Point two, bend the knee. There's an incredible courage in Jesus riding on that donkey down that hill. He knows what he's getting himself into. Have you ever faced a situation where you know what you're walking into? You know, this isn't going to be fun. This isn't going to be easy. <clears throat> Quite frankly, this is going to be hard, and this is going to be painful, and this is going to, I'm going to pay a price for this one. This one is going to take a piece out of me. And days like that, how much courage does it take us to get out of bed? Get dressed and go do whatever we have to do. Jesus knows how the priests and the Pharisees are going to respond to this. And this isn't about Jesus being omniscient. This is common sense. And Jesus knows how the Romans are going to respond to this because the Romans are very consistent. And if someone else says he is Lord, the Romans are very clear, no, no, Caesar is Lord. And if you wish to proclaim yourself as Lord, we have a place for you. Jesus shows that incredible moral courage. And I suspect 
respect, he also shows confidence. Right now, we're closing in on the end of the NCAA tournament. Some of us who have, well, frankly, little imagination, no faith, and no hope have picked Kentucky as our tournament champions. I won't name them, though, McLean. <laughs> Others of us watched last night hoping that Notre Dame would beat them. As we watched last week, you hope know, whoever they did, well, West Virginia, that was a very brief hope. <laughs> but you watch when Kentucky walks on the floor, and half the time, you wonder if the game is already over before the first jump ball. Because they're big blue, they're Kentucky, they're 38 0. They've got all these first rounders. They're this, they're that. And how much confidence must they have when they put that jersey on and they walk on the court? Bob over here is a very happy Kentucky. <laughs> um, how much confidence must they have? And the amazing thing is that as Jesus rides down that hill on that donkey, unarmed, to face the greatest empire in the world and the entire religious establishment, two forces that he know will collide and will kill him. He is supremely confident of victory. He is supremely confident that the work that he is setting out to do will be accomplished. And I wonder in this day and age, when we read about society changing, we read about 7 million people losing their faith from one census to the prior census, going from maybe some religious preference to no religious preference at all. When we face the challenges of a society where there are so many more distractions and so many things that stand in our way. What if we were confident? What if we were confident in the victory of God? That this world, this world first off that God loves, God loves so much that he gave his son for this world. And this world where there are empires and there are religious institutions and there are all of these things that stand in the way of God and the way of God's way. <clears throat> in so many ways that the powers to hurt and destroy impact and affect us. Especially the power of death. And what if we face those powers, including death itself, with complete confidence that we are facing a beaten foe, that when it comes to the contest between the power of death and the power of God, it is West Virginia, or it is Kentucky versus West Virginia. It is a completely unequal contest. And victory is sure before the first jump ball. What if we so completely trusted ourselves to the purpose of God that just as Jesus rode down that mountain and went into that fight, We could face whatever it is we face in our lives with complete confidence that the good and perfect purpose of God, that we have a part to play in, will be accomplished, will be fulfilled. But the day is coming, as Paul shows us, when every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and even under the earth. And every tongue will confess, some with joy, some with wonder, and some unwillingly. Some because they have no choice, some because the power 
of love that they are seeing in this Jesus is so great and so overwhelming that all they can do is bend the knee. This day, as we face whatever it is we face, stand on the promise and bend your knee. Our confession of faith, you see the one there from the confession of 67. I'm going to change that too because it's been that kind of week. This one comes from Philippians. It's three words, the most ancient creed of all. <coughs> Jesus is Lord. Jesus yes, is Lord. Lord.
And I also ask to pray for Evelyn with some health problems as well. Uh, also, I uh, want to keep the DiGiacomo family in your prayers. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, Jim had some sort of a heart episode at the funeral yesterday, and I appreciate Carol pointing it out to me yesterday. Uh, and he was checked out, was taken to the ER, evaluated, and uh, he did not have a heart attack. So, so that's the good news, but there's still some follow-up to be done. And as you can imagine, it's just a very difficult time for that family as well. Yes? He was out walking the dog this morning, so uh, mm -hmm. he looked tired, but he's out. Okay, so Jim was out walking the dog this morning. The dog is doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> Although as a Notre Dame fan, maybe Jim's not. Let's <laughs> Oh Lord, our God, what a blessing it is that we can come to you. We can approach you with our cares and concerns, with all that is on our hearts. We can come to you. And oh Lord, you not only welcome us, but you tell us to come to you. And to bring our cares to you and to lay them at your feet. For you are gentle and humble in heart, and we will find rest for our souls. O oh Lord, we come to you this morning as those yearning for rest for our souls. We pray for the Giacomo family in this hour of deep grief. We pray, Lord, in particular, you be with Jim as they sort out what's going on with him physically. O oh Lord, with all the family as they come to terms with Steve's death. Bless and keep them all, Lord, we pray. And I pray, Lord, for my family as we continue to come to grips with Gary's death. I pray that you would bless us and renew in us all that assured certain promise of resurrection. Lord, we pray also for what's going on in Manny's family. We pray for Evelyn and pray for her health problems, that you would bring healing to her. We pray, O oh Lord, for for his grandmother, that you would be with her and that they would be able to bring treatments to her so that she could be healed and be well again. We pray, Lord, for Bev as she is in need of a kidney and liver transplant. We pray, Lord, that that could be accomplished and that that would go well. We thank you, Lord, that for Shauna's friend Phil, the transplant did go well and that she is, or that he rather is, is healing and recovering. We pray that you would be with him in that transition process. Be, O Lord, with Stacy's caregiver, Eileen, and we pray, Lord, healing for her as she deals with, with the symptoms of a heart attack. Lord, we're thankful that so often these difficult times that we go through, by our invitations to make changes so that we might know greater health and greater well-being. But we pray for all who find this to be a time of transition and change. Continue to pray for the family of Jane Klebowski as they continue come to terms with her death. And we pray, O oh Lord, that in all these things, the light of your love and grace would shine in us and through us. May your peace that passes all understanding guard our hearts and minds, that we may walk with you in absolute confidence of your victory over sin, and evil, and death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, one for us all on this holiest of weeks. Through Christ we pray, we are taught to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever.
serve the needy with an open hand. We are sent to serve the stranger with an open mind. We are sent to serve our neighbor with an open heart. We are sent to serve our Lord, whom we will meet when we serve. And as we go forth to serve, we do not go alone. The Lord, our King, goes with us, above us to watch over us, beneath us to sustain us, beside us to befriend us, behind us to defend us, before us to show us the way, and always within us, making all things, including us, new. Go in peace. Go with God. Amen.